I feel pumped today. Anyone else feel pumped today? I feel pumped today. I'm excited today. Anyone else excited to be in church? Come on. Let's pretend like we're at least excited. Let's pretend we're Pentecostal. You excited to be in church? There it is. There it is. I'm excited uh, because I firmly believe that God's got something amazing for us today and Uh, amazing for each and every one of us today. The Word tells us in the book of Hebrews to come boldly to the throne of our gracious God, to to come into His presence with boldness. Why? Because when we do, He promises to meet us there. In Matthew 18, we're told where two or more are gathered in my name, I am there. And James chapter 4 says, draw near to God and He will draw near to you. Why am I saying all this? Because I believe that our God is here with us this morning, church. And I also believe that when God shows up, things begin to change. Who else believes that this morning? So one more time, anyone else excited for an encounter with the living God today? Come on. Come on, anyone else? There we go, there we go. There we go, I'm so excited. And, I, I, and to get to it this morning, I'm excited because we're starting a brand new collection of talks, a collection of conversations called Ghost Stories. Ghost Stories. And yeah, I realize that Halloween isn't for another eight months or so, but that's okay because that's not the type of ghost stories that I'm talking about today. I'm not talking about stories told around a campfire about things that go bump in the night. I'm not talking about tales meant to scare you before you crawl up in your blankets before bed, but I'm talking about something else entirely. Over the next four weeks or so, we're going to be diving in in order to to talk about a person, a person that I, I believe has actually been tragically neglected by the modern church, a person whose importance has been so overlooked in recent times, and that person is someone we call the Holy Ghost, or if you don't read the King James Version of the Bible, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Let me ask you real quick, have you ever found yourself reading stories from the Bible and, and you thought to yourself, man, I wish I could have been there, or, or, or man, I wish I could experience something like that? Anybody? Am I the only one? Okay. For instance, I don't know, maybe you're reading the book of Acts when Peter was set free from prison and his chains just fell off his wrist and you think to yourself, right, man, I, I got some chains that I wish would fall off right now. Anybody? Or, or maybe in the same book you read about, about Peter and John, how they miraculously healed that lame man near the temple gates, and, and, you, and if, as you did, you thought to yourself, man, my back's been hurting kind of fierce recently. Can I get some of that? Anybody? Anybody? Or lastly, maybe, maybe you've read about how, how throughout his life the, as a missionary, how even though things always seemed to come up against him, Paul always seemed to overcome whatever obstacle got in his way. And you think, man, how did he get through time in time again. If that's you, if you said, have thought anything like those or those thoughts themselves, I think this conversation might just be for you today. This series might just be for you. And I say that because according to the Word, according to the Bible, the one responsible for everything I just listened is listed is a person called the Holy Spirit. And more than that, the same person who is responsible for the wonders we read about in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit, he's still just as active today as he was in the stories we read about in the Bible. I firmly believe that. What does this mean? It means that the same power that we read about every week in this place is active and it's available to you, to me, to all of us as we walk through this life. Isn't that encouraging this morning, church? And to me, it's actually kind of sad about the modern church, is that for most of us, we don't walk around with that kind of boldness now, do we? We don't navigate this life with the conviction that the same power that can raise the dead is available to each and every one of us in church. That's the purpose of this series, amen? That as we begin to recount these stories of what the Holy Spirit has done before, we can uh, come to realize that greater things are yet to come. That we can come to believe that the Holy Spirit is not just some mystical force or power or, or, or Christianese word, but, but He's a person and He's here to empower you to live this life to the absolute fullest. Amen? And it's my hope, <clears throat> sorry, my hope and my prayer. That throughout this series, just like we sang earlier, that each of us can become more aware of his presence and that we could traverse this life with the fullness that only the Holy Spirit can offer. Amen? Amen. So before we fully dive in today, I just want to ask you guys a question. My question uh, this morning is this. Have you ever interacted with someone before uh, who seemed so familiar but you couldn't quite place who they were? 
right? Like, like, have you ever interacted with someone who, who uh, like, you're, you're talking to someone and there's just something about them that's almost like that deja vu feeling, right? Like, like, I know you, but I just don't know from where. Anybody have moments like that or is it just me? Is my memory just fading on me or something? Or, okay, okay. Real talk, the older I get, the more this seems to happen to me, I, I swear. It's like a daily occurrence at this point. I'll see someone random and be like, hey, I, I think I know that person. And somehow it's always in the most awkward of places too, right? Like, like, I don't know, I'll be cruising Walmart and nature starts to call. So I'll go pull up to the urinal and another dude comes in. I'm just like, man, I know that guy. I know him from somewhere. But, but, but how do you figure it out there, right? Who wants to have that conversation in the Walmart bathroom? No one wants to reminisce over the porcelain throne, right? Um, but it does. It happens to me way more often than it used to. And, and though I've, I've mostly just kind of chalked it up to having a terrible memory, there are still times or I don't know, it's almost like this divine happenstance, right? A couple weeks ago, I had a moment just like that, and it led to something pretty cool. And, and to set the scene, it was actually, <clears throat> sorry, I was actually at work at my dad's medical office at the time. And uh, for some quick info at the office, though we, we do focus on general doctor's office stuff, uh, we, we do more than that. That's not all we do. We also do a bunch of like occupational stuff as well. Things like respirator fit tests and work physicals and relevant to our story today, drug testing. So I'm at work and this guy comes in and he tells me he's here for a drug test and right away, man, that familiarity is just there. I know this dude, but I can't place him to save my life. His face is so familiar, but I don't know where I know him from. So I get all the paperwork ready, get them pulled back. We do the drug test, whole nine yards, right? And, and throughout it all, this is eating me alive. I know this guy, but I don't know from where. And so much so that, that I, I feel like I can't even ask him, right? Because, like, what if he remembers me, but I don't remember him? How terrible will that make me feel, right? Um, so we finish everything up, and just before he leaves, it finally clicks in my brain, right? I figure it out. This guy actually used to go to youth group with me as a teenager as a teenager. In fact, when he gave his life to Jesus, I was the one that actually led him to Jesus some 17 years ago. And before he leaves, I, I just decided to be open and honest with him, right? I, I tell him, brother, the moment you came in, I had this feeling like I knew you, and I just couldn't figure out from where, but, but I just figured it out. We went to youth group together about 17 years ago, and I don't know if you remember me, but I just want to let you know that I remember you, and it's so awesome to see you, and I hope you're doing good. And man, after hearing that, his eyes kind of lit up, right? And he told me, yeah, man, same thing. I, you look so familiar, but I didn't want to be that guy, right? And be like, where do I know you from, right? And, and from there, we did that whole, you know, how you, how you doing, how you been, what's new thing, that right? That we get all caught up, and we start talking for a little bit, and we find out that you know, probably about 16 years ago, he moved away from Safford. And, and since he moved away, life had been pretty rough. That is, his, his brother had died. And his mom battled cancer and a couple times, actually, and it came back. And, and things hadn't gone the way he had hoped they would have gone. But despite it all, he still hung on to Jesus. And he actually, before he left, he thanked me for being so kind to him as kids and, and caring enough to talk to him about Jesus all those years ago and that it made such a huge impact in his life. And overall, it was a pretty cool experience, pretty cool experience. And as I was prepping for my talk this last week, for some reason, the story kept popping into my head. And this, this interaction happened a couple of months ago. And but I just kept thinking about it and thinking about it. I kept thinking about this guy, and as I did, it kind of brought me to a thought about our topic for today, and that thought is this. For a lot of people, for a lot of Jesus followers, I think we get the same reaction, the same feeling, right, when we talk about the Holy Spirit. We get almost this, this deja vu-like familiarity when we talk about the Holy Spirit, and I think we get this feeling because real talk, if I'm being honest, the modern church Man, it hasn't been real good about explaining who the Holy Spirit actually is. The modern church hasn't been very good about explaining who the Holy Spirit actually is. Over the years, the modern church, to me at least, has glossed over the importance of the Holy Spirit, not just in church services, not just in the Bible, but in our everyday lives. 
we've managed to reduce the Holy Spirit simply to be like a ghost story, right? Like a tall tale, like a folk tale almost. This concept, this mysticism, this spiritual force or aura, right? And that just kind of floats around. But something important that we need to realize today is this. The Holy Spirit, it's not just a thought. It's not just an idea. It's not just, you know, some juju force floating all around us. But the Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is a person. He's not just any person like you or me or like Obi-Wan Kenobi as a force ghost, right? That's not who he is. But the Holy Spirit is an equal part of what we call the Trinity. And what that means is this. The Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is God, just as much so as the Father, just as much so as the Son. And, and the role He's played in our world is so much more than we typically realize or understand or even give credit for. <laughs> but He is. The Holy Spirit is totally God. And it's my goal this morning that as we start this conversation about the Holy Spirit in this series, Ghost Stories, to first dive in to find out exactly who He is and why He's been so important in our world and why He's so important in our lives. Amen? Because before we can really begin to walk in the Spirit in our everyday lives, we first need to know who He really is. Amen? Before we dive in, though, as always, let's open up to our God in prayer this morning, church. As soon as I get a drink of water. Join me. Father God, we thank you today. Lord Jesus, we thank you. Holy Spirit, we thank you for being present here in this place this morning. And just as we sang earlier, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. We need you here. We want you here. We want to, to feel your presence today. We need to feel your presence in this place this morning, Jesus. We need you to move. We need you to sweep us up our feet. We need you to change the atmosphere in this place. And we need you to speak to us in a brand new way. Fire of heaven, we need you to fall down in this place. We need you to, be, to fill us completely. We need your empowerment, Holy Spirit. We need your wisdom. We need your, your boldness. And we need your voice. So our number one prayer is always... That Jesus, these would be your words, that they wouldn't be me, that they would be straight from you, Holy Spirit, and that we could receive them. That if we've got a heart of stone in this place, that, that would stop us from receiving this word today, that you would break it off, you would melt it down, and give us a new heart, Holy Spirit, new ears to hear you today. So move, Holy Spirit, and we say these things in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> So yeah, as I said earlier, um, I've been battling a, a chest cold. Um, I've been tested for everything, so I don't I don't have the the COVID or the RSV or the flu or anything like that. But it's just been this lingering thing. I've been on antibiotics, and, and I thought I kicked it yesterday while I was feeling really good, and I woke up this morning, and here I am. So um, there's a story I just want to remind you of real quick. The prophet Elisha. Um, he was walking down the road, and, and some kids, they, they pop out of the bushes, and they start making fun of him for being bald. And as a result, uh, he, he asked God to send some bears, and the bears came and ate the kids. So next time you think about making fun of the pastor, the precedent is there. Um, it's happened before. <laughs> I'm not scared to call the bears. Um, but if you're following along or taking notes, I'm sorry, that was really stupid. Don't laugh at that. If you're following along or taking notes with us today, we're going to be hanging out. We're in the book of Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. In real talk, I love the book of Acts. I, I actually just, uh, I'm taking some classes right now to get my license with the Assemblies of God. I'm certified right now, but figured five years of being a lead pastor, I needed to kind of bump that up a little bit. So, and the last class we did was the book of Acts. And something interesting is, um, most theologians, uh, Acts, so Acts is actually short for Acts of the Apostles, but the sentiment that most theologians uh, and pastors and, you know, preachers, whatever, what have you, that they say that if, if they could, they would change the name from Acts of the Apostles to Acts of the Holy Spirit, 
Because that's just way more fitting. Because the whole book of Acts is just what the Holy Spirit was up to through the apostles, but but what the Holy Spirit was up to. So I I, I love the book of Acts. If you're really looking to dive into something to see what the Holy Spirit's all about, I just want to encourage you to read the book of Acts. Luke, uh, and it's so cool because Luke is a doctor, right? He's a scientist, but he still uh, experiences and writes down the things that the Holy Spirit did. And it's just so amazing. But but just for some, some quick setup, before we uh, jump in regarding uh, what we're doing, this point in, in Scripture that we're about to read, it's actually regarded as kind of a turning point in church history. Because this moment is where we can see this paradigm shift, right? And, and, and we can see this moment where the Holy Spirit, it actually becomes accessible to everyone who follows Jesus. So for some quick backstory, at this point in Scripture, Jesus, he's already been tried, he's already been crucified, buried, resurrected. He's actually already been ascended to heaven. He'd come, he'd paid for our sins, and he had dipped, right? And, and from there, we're told that the disciples, they're kind, of, <clears throat> they're kind of like recouping, right? The last four or so years have been a whirlwind. Uh, so they're kind of just kind of getting sorted out. They're kind of catching their breath, getting their heads screwed back on correct, and they're getting together, they, they, they're taking care of some business, right? Uh, for instance, they they, they got to find a replacement for Judas, the guy that betrayed Jesus and then killed himself afterwards. So they got to find a replacement for him. They end up choosing a guy named Matthias. Uh, and, and life, they're just telling us about how they're just kind of getting settled back in, settled into the swing of things, of, of, of life again. And, and then we're told that 10 days after Jesus ascended to heaven, 10 days later, we're told that something awesome happened. We're told that a promise that Jesus made when he was still on earth with them was about to come true. The disciples are hanging out together like they always do. They're doing life together. They're in uh, what they just call an upper room. And this is what it says in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, uh, that Jesus, this promise was about to come true, that the Holy Spirit was about to come. This is what it says. On the day of Pentecost... All of the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house that they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled upon them. And each present was filled with the Holy Spirit, and it began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. In other words, hold on, I'm screwing everything up. In other words, we're told that the Holy Spirit came down and started doing some weird stuff, but some awesome stuff at the same time, right? Uh, And just for a moment, I kind of want to take a step back and I kind of want to clarify some stuff, right? Because for so many people, they think that this moment is where the Holy Spirit's actually first introduced to us. Now, this is the first time the Holy Spirit has interacted with the world. And, and even though earlier I said at this moment it kind of marked the paradigm shift, it might surprise you to find out that this is not actually our first introduction to this person that we call the Holy Spirit. In fact, it doesn't even come close to the first time we hear about the Holy Spirit in all of the Bible. But if we want to see the first mention of the Holy Spirit in all the Bible, we actually have to look all the way back at the first page of the Bible. Back in Genesis chapter 1, we're, we're told this in verses 1 through 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty, and the darkness covered the deep waters, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the water. If you look at the original Hebrew, it translates to, to wind or breath, right? And that's the same word translated when every time it says Holy Spirit in the New Testament, it translates to the same word. So not only was our first verse not the first time the Holy Spirit shows up, but from this verse that we just read, we can see that He's been a part of all of this all along, right? Since the very beginning, before the earth was even formed, the Holy Spirit was right there. And really, to begin to fully understand who exactly the Holy Spirit is and His role in our lives, something we need to first talk about and kind of grasp and wrap our brain around is is something that we like to call the Trinity. The Trinity. Now, full disclosure, that word Trinity is never used in the Scriptures at all. 
Not once is the word Trinity used, but the thought and the truth behind the phrase is scattered throughout the word. And again, full disclosure, I personally like to consider the Trinity, this theology, right, as kind of a more advanced level subject matter when it comes to things like Christianity and the church and stuff, because real talk, it's confusing. I'm going to be just blunt. It is super confusing, so confusing, in fact, that most scholars on this subject, they've actually agreed that it's basically not fully comprehensible to us, that our human brains in their current state can't fully understand it. But even though we can't fully grasp the whole idea behind how it works, we can grasp the basics of it, right? So that said... When it comes to this thing we call the Trinity, what we basically mean when we talk about it, when we talk about God, we're actually referring to three distinct parts, if you will. I'm going to tell you, me trying to explain this, is going to, there, there's going to be some heresy involved because we can't explain it without using some metaphors that don't actually work out 100%. Just know that, uh, I'm sorry, burn me at the stake later for my heresy, we'll figure it out, but, but just know. So when we talk about God... When we talk about him, we're, we're actually talking about three distinct parts, right? Three distinct parts, and those parts are as follows. One, God the Father. Two is God the Son. And three is God the Holy Spirit. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Together they make up what we call the Godhead or the Trinity. And whenever we talk about each person of the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, we do so with the understanding that each is fully and truly divine, fully and truly divine, that God is one essence, not a jumble of parts or pieces, that the, the, the persons of the Trinity, they're not like building blocks that we combine to form one God, but that they are each God. And even though it's confusing, we, we believe that God's actually revealed to us this great mystery of the Trinity, that there is a plurality with their oneness, that within the Godhead, there are distinct persons. There are self-distinctions. That each person is distinct from the others in the way that they relate to each other and the way that they work in God's creation. That the Spirit isn't the Son and the Father. That the Son isn't the Spirit and the Father. The Father isn't the Spirit or the Son. But that they are distinct in and of themselves. Now, for some of these relationships that we just talked about, we can kind of understand at least a little bit, right? Like, you know, real talk, the, the, the relationship between the Father and the Son. That's something I think most of us, especially if we are already followers of Jesus, we can kind of grasp. We're probably at least a little knowledgeable about how a father can relate to a son, right? But when it comes to the Spirit, oftentimes we perceive this as this, like, mystery, right? Like this weird, like, juju, like, I can't do it. Uh, it, it weird and mystical, hard to understand. <coughs> Truth is, though, while the Holy Spirit is different from the Father and the Son, the, the Bible tell, tells us a lot about the Spirit's relationship with the other persons of the Trinity, as well as His role in God's creation. So all that said, if we were to try to describe each of the different roles that each of the different members of the Trinity have, though it might not be the most accurate, I think the best way to kind of wrap around it in our brains is by saying it like this. So when it comes to the Father, He's presented as the source, the source of it all. He's also presented as the sender, and he's also presented as the planner of salvation. So he's the source, the sender, and the planner of salvation. The son, on the other hand, Jesus, he's the means, right? He's the sent one. He's the achiever of salvation. The father sent, the, the son came to save us. The Father planned it, but the Son accomplished it on the cross. You're tracking with me. Is it making a little bit of sense? When it comes to the Holy Spirit, though, if we were to use a single word to describe the Spirit and how He relates to the Father and the Son, I think that word would be procession. While the Father, He's uncreated, and the Son is eternally begotten by the Father, the Holy Spirit eternally proceeds from the Father and the Son. So if the Father is the planner... The Son is the accomplisher. And that means the Holy Spirit is the applier. The Father planned salvation. The Son accomplished salvation. And the Holy Spirit applies salvation to 
the believers. Is that making sense? Is it kind of at least a little bit making sense? I hope so, because we're not, this is all I got. Uh, in short, in short, if I'm breaking it down, a good way to think about it when it comes to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God's presence on earth. And he's also God's presence inside of the believers. Okay, right? Like, that's nice. I think I get it. Maybe. I don't know, but like, still, what's the point? What's the point? What does this really matter in the grand scheme of things? I'll tell you, it matters because as I said before, the verses we read earlier about how the Holy Spirit coming on the day of Pentecost, they marked this paradigm shift, a paradigm shift, a shift in how we would begin to relate with God in a new way, a new way to be human. Because before, before Jesus came and paid the price for our sins, when it came to the presence of God, we were essentially cut off, right? Right? In the beginning, when God first created us, we were with him and one with him. But but after we sinned and fell short, we were cut off. God was too good, too holy for us to be with him. We were too dirty, too messed up. We couldn't live up to God's standards. And as a result, all of our interactions with God, they had to be through other means, essentially. For instance, the book of Exodus, when God spoke to Moses, he spoke to him through a what? A burning bush. In the book of Daniel, when he was speaking to the king, he was literally writing on the wall to speak to him. If you ever wanted to know the term writing on the wall, that's where that comes from. You're welcome. In Numbers, when he spoke to Balaam, this one's my favorite. How did he speak to Balaam? He spoke to him through a donkey. Angels, right? So many messages from God were given through angels. Let me ask, have any of you spoken with an angel recently? Probably not. But fast forward. Fast forward after Jesus, he'd come and he paid the price for our sins. And now he's sent the Holy Spirit. And since then, things change. Things have changed. We don't have to rely on donkeys anymore. We don't have to rely on burning bushes to speak with God. We don't have to rely on angels to hear from God anymore. Why? Because when we put our trust in Jesus, we're told what? That the Holy Spirit lives inside of us, that he's made us his home, that he's made us his temple, his dwelling. And it's through the Holy Spirit that everything else happens, church. It's through the Holy Spirit that our faith begins to grow and blossom. It's through the Holy Spirit that God begins to change us. Now, I fully understand. <clears throat> I get it. This might have just made you even more confused. And if that's the case, I am so sorry. Uh, go listen to someone smarter than me. I'm sure someone around the corner would be sufficient. But to break it down, the Holy Spirit is important. It's so important. Just as important as the Father. Just as important as the Son Man, we haven't really acted like that, have we? You know, for a lot of Christians, you know, we have this thought that when it comes to the Trinity, that is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Bible. That's not the case. It's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Equal in power, co-equal in majesty. And it's through the Holy Spirit that everything happens. It's through the Holy Spirit that honestly we can begin to even come to believe in Jesus. Because you know, you can't believe in Jesus without the Holy Spirit making it possible. Now for those here who maybe this is the first time you've really heard about the Holy Spirit. This is the first like in-depth conversation you've had about him. Maybe, I don't know, maybe you grew up in a tradition that really didn't emphasize the Holy Spirit or, or just tragically downplayed his importance, right? If that's you, you might, you might feel a little intimidated with all of this. That, that maybe we bit off a little bit more we can chew, right? And believe me, I feel that. I do. But as a way to help ground all of this, I want you to think about something in maybe a little different of a way. Remember earlier when I said that the Holy Spirit is God's presence on earth. 
Not only that, but he's also God's presence inside of us. I want you to think about that for just a moment because if the Holy Spirit is God's presence on earth and his presence inside us, you know what that means? That means all of this is not as foreign as you might have initially thought. Why? Because if you've ever had any encounters with God before, guess what? That means you've really been encountering the Holy Spirit this entire time. All this time it's been the Holy Spirit. It means that this isn't foreign, but it's simply to realign our perspective. We might not have recognized that he was the one at work, but if we if we truly are born again, right, if we believe in Jesus, if we believe he's our Savior, that he came down and paid the price for our sin and wrong, that we have put our trust in him. That means our history with God is saturated with experiences of the Holy Spirit. And I'll tell you, the Holy Spirit gets a bad rap sometimes. You know, we are a Pentecostal church, so I'll say we we believe in things like speaking in tongues. We believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. We believe in prophecy and things like that. And yeah, it's weird. I'll be honest with you, it's very weird. First time I experienced it, it was weirded out. I almost left, but I'm glad I didn't. Do you know why? the Holy Spirit spoke to me and he came to this conclusion that if being a little weird gives me access to the power of God, I'll be weird every day. Amen? And don't get me wrong. A, I never want to box in the Holy Spirit. But B, you know, the the Bible talks to us about order of things and Paul goes really in depth in the Corinthians on how we're supposed to speak in tongues and stuff like that. And we're going to get to that later on in this series. But for today... I really just want to focus on is who he is. And who he is is God. Who he is is every interaction you've ever had with God has been with the Holy Spirit. And that's what you need to understand is that this it's not just some some weird guy that makes us you know, flop around on the floor like a fish and, and babble in a different language. That's not who he is. That's something he does do, don't get me wrong, but that's not who he is. In a spirit filled church isn't one that just freaks out and screams and yodels at the top of our lungs, but a spirit-filled church is one that sees that the Holy Spirit is important in our everyday lives and it understands that we have access to Him and we can walk through every step of this life with Him empowering us. That's a spirit-filled church. And today all we're doing is learning to acknowledge Him. Learning how to give Him the credit That's it. That's it. Simply acknowledging him and inviting him directly to be a part of all of this. Inviting him directly to be a part of our lives. So if you're here today, and again, I don't know, maybe this is intimidating, or maybe you're just so confused you don't even know what to do. Uh, If so, something to remember, something we're going to dive into further next week, is that the Holy Spirit, again, he hasn't been sent to freak us out or to confuse us, but he's actually been sent to be the way Jesus phrased it is is to be a helper. The Holy Spirit has been sent to us to be a helper, to be the one to walk with us throughout the ups and downs of this life. And as a result, we don't need to rely on our own strength or our own power, but we can begin to rely on Him. And when moments arise in our lives that we can't handle, through Him we can overcome whatever is thrown our way. And I don't know, maybe you're here and you need that today. Maybe you're here and you need a helper. If so, I just want to encourage you today that the Holy Spirit, I believe he is in this place. I believe he he is here uh, and he's here for you today. And there's only one requirement. One requirement. That we place our trust first in Jesus. That we place our trust first on the work that Jesus accomplished on the cross, that he is the one who was sent and accomplished our salvation through his sacrifice. That's all it takes to get the access to the power of the Holy Spirit. That once we do, we're told that the, the Holy Spirit, immediately he gets to work on transforming us into a new creation. So if that's you, and I don't know, maybe you've never put your trust in Jesus before, or maybe, maybe you're here, and, and maybe you've, you've placed your trust in Jesus before, but, but over time that trust has begun to wane or decrease, or, or maybe you've placed it somewhere else. 
I don't know if that's you. I just want to encourage you, and I want to invite you to give this Jesus thing a shot, whether it's for the first time or the millionth time, because, well, I can't guarantee that your life will instantly get better. I'm not going to tell you that because, I don't know, I've seen it happen like once, but it's not a guarantee. He's not going to pay your rent the moment you place your trust in Jesus. You're not going to get a set of keys to a new Cadillac or anything like that. But what I can tell you is putting your trust in Jesus will be the best decision you can ever make because once you do, the Holy Spirit gets to work. Once you do, the Holy Spirit begins to speak to us and begins to change us and begins to comfort us. And he begins to become an active part of your life because that's what he wants. He wants to be an active part of your life. He wants to walk with you through it all. He wants to, to be beside you when you feel alone. He wants to comfort you when you're in grief. He wants to give you peace when the world around us is in chaos. He wants to share every single moment with you. He wants to give you life and life to the absolute fullest. So if that's you today, with every head bowed, every eye closed, whether you're here in person or if you're watching online, I don't know, but if you want to give this Christianity thing a shot, like I said, for the first time or the millionth time, it doesn't, doesn't matter. In fact, this is a decision that, that if you make it today, you're going to have to make it again tomorrow and the next day and the next day after that and every day until we get to meet him face to face. But if that's you, if you want to give this Christianity thing a shot, this might seem a little weird, but on the count of three, I just want you to raise your hand. I just want you to raise your hand. It's not because we want to count you or hunt you down after service or, or sign you up for our email list or anything like that. It's simply because when we uh, respond to things like this, when we, the act of raising your hand physically, it makes it so much more real to you. It's an outward expression of an inward condition. So on the count of three, if you want to place your trust in Jesus this morning, if you want to start a real tangible relationship with the Holy Spirit today, I want you to raise your hand. One, Jesus, I trust you. Two, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Three, all across this place. All across this place.